You know, they say real estate is all about location, location, location. Well, the moon is this amazing location. The moon is likely to be an initial focus of where we can extend the economic sphere of Earth into space. And that has both extremely positive connotations because liberal international relations theorists concentrate on absolute gains, which is that through cooperation, you can get way, way more. Hey, Space Watchers, this is Space Cafe Radio, your channel about trends, great people and awesome topics. With the Munich Security Conference just passed and still in memory, I try to find more information about the big global power play in space. So I started to search for literature and one book catched my interest. Scramble for the Sky, the great power competition to control the resources of outer space by Peter Garrison and Dr. Namrata Goswami. You will say Namrata? Isn't that the guest in Dr. Emma Gatti's Space Cafe Black Ops series? And you're right. So I reached out to Peter Garrison, retired Lieutenant Colonel of the US Air Force and strategist, analyst and scholar to talk with him about the book that will stand the time. You will hear why later. I'm Thorsten, publisher of Spacewatch.global. Enjoy this conversation. Welcome, Peter Garrison. The book we will talk about is Scramble for the Sky, the great power competition to control the resources of outer space, released in 2020 and still more than ever relevant. But it's also pretty nerdy title, Peter. Can you tell us a bit your background and what motivates you to write such a book? Absolutely. Just to deal with the title, the title was extremely deliberately chosen because we wanted to draw a distinction between the paradigm of a race, which assumes that getting somewhere first is what matters, and that there was necessarily a destination, and a scramble, meaning this continuous attempt to gather resources, or you can imagine food scramble where people in our picnic are trying to get everything they can before somebody else comes and takes it away. And we wanted to be able to give a different image for what we thought was happening and what was different about competition in space today versus in the past. What motivated me on my part to get into this was that I had been in the space community for a while, where a lot of these thoughts about space resources had been bouncing around. But there was a huge disconnect because I had spent a long career in the U.S. Air Force, which prior to the Space Force coming of age were the folks thinking about national security competition in space. And it struck me this tremendous disconnect between how people Internal to the space community, the innovators were thinking about the possibilities and the potential geopolitical import of them, and the paucity of conversation in the international relations world, in the policy and security world that just seemed to completely ignore these. This book was a very deliberate attempt to bridge those conversations, to have a crossover hit into the international relations world such that they could be armed with a well-reasoned argument as to why this matters and why folks should pay attention to it, and hopefully with enough heft and weight of, of citations that it wouldn't be easy to dismiss as a, something that was just a fantasy. I see. Taking the current conflicts on Earth, are space resources a thing? Are nations starting to compete for them already? I think ultimately it's up to the reader of the book to decide whether or not we have made that case, but certainly I'm convinced that's the case. And when I say that, I mean, we're just at the very, very beginnings of this, right? It's not like you have armies of nation states that are locking up individual asteroids in areas of the moon yet. But, you know, for years now, we've had nation states that are in fact concerned about this, that have written policies and law about it, that have started infant programs to do this, and that make statements in public that lead you to believe that they are concerned about this possibility and that they're concerned enough that they're willing to alter their policies and their programs. So I think it is, and I'm sure we can get into it, there, there are numerous examples 
of how this has made it into national discussion and policy, how it's made it into actual law, and what are some actual programs that are examples of this? Well, go for it. So how and why are they doing it today? I think the reason is pretty rational. If you look at how at least international relations scholars think about power, you know, the realist school of international relations recognizes that nations are very sensitive to relative gains and that an ability of one country to have a larger economy means that they have more coercive power and attractive power and that they can probably field a larger, more capable military, and that should they go to war, they have a deeper war chest that they could last longer, mobilize more. Most of the time, even great powers are not actively at war, or certainly tried not to actively be at war with other great powers. They're always elbowing each other to try to get a power advantage. And when they talk about what constitutes this latent power advantage, theorists like Waltz have come up with broad criteria that sort of suggests what is your latent power? So what is the size of your economy? What is the size of your population? What is your resource base? How much land do you have? What is your productive capacity? And if you imagine that those are dependent, all of those are dependent on some sort of resource base. And when you think about what the actual science shows, the inner solar system has on the order of a billion times the resources that we have here on Earth. A billion times, right? So if you think about in European history, what a difference merely a doubling of land in the New World meant and how keen competition was for those resources to secure that position for everything. Colonies from agriculture, timber from the New World, furs, gold, of course. Those things affected the balance of power within Europe. And so European colonial powers were very concerned about how their rivals could get a competitive position abroad. Those that took an early role in those colonial efforts did well, at least in that initial part. What we have here is folks that become aware in the policy environment that there is this vast amount of resources. For example, you can fit all of China, the United States, the Americas into the continent of Africa. Africa is just huge. But the land area of the moon is actually larger than Africa. And in many ways, it has even more exciting possibilities because it's one-sixth gravity, which means that to get off it and go further, for instance, in into the asteroid belt, is much easier. It has vacuum. We make so many important products on Earth using vacuum. And it's so close to Earth. So, you know, they say real estate is all about location, location, location. Well, the moon is this amazing location. The moon is likely to be an initial focus of where we can extend the economic sphere of Earth into space. And that has both extremely positive connotations because liberal international relations theorists concentrate on absolute gains, which is that through cooperation, you can get way, way more. And in fact, even in hierarchical systems where you've got a hegemon, generally speaking, even if the hegemon benefits differentially, it sort of all boats rise. And so an ability to access these resources in space is never just about relative national gains. I mean, they fundamentally contain basically all the answers to our current problems. You know, if you're want to have a green economy on Earth, and you don't want to destroy your environment through mining, all those resources, those metals and everything you would need for a green economy are abundant in the near-Earth asteroids and in the asteroid belt, far more abundant than anything we would have on Earth. And so the potential to grow a green economy is staggeringly huge. Also, if you wanted to have 24-hour green power, you could build an entire space energy grid of solar power satellites beaming terawatts of power to Earth. And this is completely scalable. You know, the Earth needs about 18 terawatts of constant power right now. And a fully developed world where everybody had, you know, a U.S. or European lifestyle in terms of energy usage might need on the order of 50 terawatts. Geostationary orbit is spaced out enough that you could put thousands of these satellites, something on the order of, you know, 230 terawatts, something six or seven times what a fully developed world would need. And that would only require on the order of a millionth of 1% of the mass of the moon. So you could 
literally turn moon dust into a green energy system that grow our global GDP more than tenfold. And so there are tremendously bright reasons for us here on Earth and then for our progeny and the ability to spread Earth life and our biosphere to places now dead, increasing our chances of survival of our species and all the species that we're stewards of on Earth. But it also means that, you know, that in all things, those who sort of are smarter about this development are going to benefit. And with the keys to extremely gargantuan amounts of power and resources come the same types of strings that come here on Earth. In the same way, you might be concerned about who owns your ports, who owns your IT infrastructure, who owns your supply chains of medical supplies, who owns your supply chains for generators or medicines. The same things that make Europe interested today in energy sovereignty, so as not to be, for instance, dependent on Russia for gas in the wintertime, cause people to think, do I want to be dependent on another power, and particularly a an unfriendly power. So for those of us in the West, we typically worry most about how we would be treated by an authoritarian power that may not share our concerns with human rights or privacy and could very easily turn that sort of power advantage, ownership advantage against us. And of course, for autocracies that have reason to be fearful of democracies, because we tend to see the autocratic forms of government as illegitimate and would like to replace them with a democratic government, they're also fearful of the power that that we would have if we were to, to gain those resources. And so for both reasons of just economic growth and opportunity, as well as concerns about putting yourself in a position of being coerced, there is this dynamic where the nations of the world want to secure their place in the sun. They want to secure their ability to access space resources. I thought that it was solved. It was solved in 1967 with the Outer Space Treaty and with the UN OSA or even the current Artemis Accords. What is their role in that competition that you mentioned? And I think that also in that moment when the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, a signatory to the Moon Agreement, left the agreement but they are signatory of the Artemis Accords. So how does that play together? All right, so there's a lot to unpack there, and certainly the Outer Space Treaty is still in effect. And what the Outer Space Treaty has done is to place an extremely specific restriction, which is to say that a nation-state cannot, through any means, claim a part of a non-Earth celestial body as its sovereign territory. So it doesn't matter how. Even, it doesn't say, by the way, that a nation state can't occupy. It says the occupation does not constitute a claim for national sovereignty. You can leave your flag there. It's fine. You can leave your flag there. And in fact, you can have an entire colony there. But from the perspective of international law, at least for the signatories of the treaty, that base, that colony does not constitute an eternal claim on national sovereignty. But in an important way, that's also quite meaningless because the same treaty says that you are allowed to have facilities. And once you have a facility, you have a right not to be interfered with. And you have the duty and obligation for continuing supervision. And so within that facility, your laws apply. So you have an area that can be demarcated as not to be interfered with, in which your laws apply. Now, you can't call that your territory in the same way you couldn't call a base in Antarctica your eternal territory, or at least it doesn't establish a claim under international law. But this gets to the same point. China doesn't need to be recognized as having its territory in the South China Sea, but if it de facto has administrative control and military control over that region, in what common sense way is it not effectively territory? And by the way, this is not novel. You can go back and find discussions all the way to the negotiations of the Outer Space Treaty. The United States has always maintained that, oh, I should back up and also just be, before I talk about about the position on, on extractable resources, let's talk about why this prohibition exists. 
There's a tendency in the space community to believe that this was a moment of wonderful idealism, that we, coming out of World War II, we'd seen the light and we all agreed that idealism was bad and we would hold hands and march off into the universe together. And therefore, we said, there will be no such competition in outer space. But that's an unbelievably rosy interpretation of what actually happened. What actually was happening was that the United States and the Soviet Union were engaged in a competition to get to the moon. And previously, under national law, if you could get somewhere first and plant your flag, constituted a claim. And neither power knew who was going to win, and neither power wanted to be in the position of losing the entire moon because they were behind. And so to hedge their potential losses, and because they didn't really want to compete at that time, they didn't know that there was anything of value on the moon. It was principally seen through ideological prestige lens for a global audience. And so it was rational, it appeared at the time, for the two superpowers to make sure that the other guy couldn't own the moon because they didn't know that it was completely valueless. You know, it might not be. So it's best if we don't let the other guy get claim on it. And of course, that played very well to the global audience. That certainly, you know, did not want, who I would say had no chance of being in this game and so thought it was wise to restrain the further gains of the more powerful actors. So we had this thing, the Outer Space Treaty. But it had always been the interpretation of the United States that while you cannot claim territory on the moon or other celestial bodies, that you could always extract and use. And in fact, the treaty is clear about your ability to use. And it had always been the position of the United States that essentially private industry would be allowed and that you would be able to extract things from the lunar surface in the same way that you can extract fish from the sea without claiming the sea. And over time, as asteroid mining and lunar mining became clear under President Obama, some of the asteroid mining firms worked with forward-thinking congressmen, and they wrote a legislation that said that if a U.S. company extracts resources from the moon or asteroids, that would be their property. And then subsequently under the Trump administration, there was an executive order encouraging other nations to take similar positions. And so within that light, we should say that the Moon Agreement, which is a failed treaty that doesn't have any signatories that are space-capable states. I think India is the only one. They have signed but not ratified. But even India is, I would not. And don't forget that India, and this is an interesting anecdote that you can find in our book, India very consciously hedged their bets. So there's a great interview with the former ISRO director during that mission who said that we don't know what the future of the treaties are, so we made sure that our that the little crash landing payload had the Indian tricolor flag. It, it's not as if even formerly very normative India, perhaps not as attached to Nehruvian idealism in the current leadership as before, they also hedged their bets. And in fact, this was I'm a huge admirer of Dr. Kalam. But Dr. Kalam was also one of the ones that insisted that the Indian tricolor take up mass on this payload for Chandrayaan. Of course, the United States has wanted to encourage this and to encourage this idea of use of resources through the Artemis Accords, which some people see as inconsistent with the, with the Moon Agreement. Australia has stayed in, signed both. And in the United States, the, the Moon Agreement was vigorously attacked by the space advocacy community who felt that its negation not only of national sovereignty but private property period was a step too far that to establish a and they did not think that the deep seabed authority was a good analog they felt that the redistributive ideas where you would take the most vibrant firms and force them to give away their and their intellectual property and, and the fruits of their labor was far too collective a step. And because of the attempt of the moon agreement to collectivize the resources of the moon and to put it under a, a, an international seabed-like authority, it was very much defeated by those. You certainly can't say they were vested interests. They were 
hopefuls many years ago that this would eventually be the future where you would have the possibility of the kind of progress that you're seeing with SpaceX. And in that light, you certainly could interpret Saudi Arabia's withdrawal as responding to the request of the United States executive order to for that, that position. Of course, we've seen others. We've seen Luxembourg. We've seen UAE. Japan now has a, a space mining law, um, although Russia rails against it. They apparently also have an internal law. And then China and India are both contemplating how they would put this in their own laws. So I suspect that at least the norm of resource extraction is going to become the global international norm. And, and overall, I think that's great, because if you look at where the collective mindset has gotten us, it's gotten us absolutely zero, right? In 50 years since the moon, the lack of any incentive for private enterprise has resulted in absolutely nothing being done that could advance humanity moving out or developing solutions for planet Earth. So I think this aspect, competition, is going to be very positive for humanity. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Moving is right up there with death and divorce in the Stress Olympics. But fear not. Turn that box of woes into a crate of woes with moving tips in the Life Beyond Boxes podcast with Premium Q Moving. Dive into the world of hassle-free moves, learn tips and tricks to save on cash and your sanity. Say goodbye to those moving meltdowns and hello to the smooth sailings. Or should we say smooth movings? Tune into Life Beyond Boxes with Premium Q Moving on lifebeyondboxes.com or find us on your favorite podcast platform. And with us... Unpack the secrets to a stress-free move. I know that we will come to that in a minute about the potential scenarios, but will an avatar by James Cameron a potential way forward so private companies are secured by military, so the space forces in that scenario? Well, you know, certainly it is been the history of both European and American power that economic interests have driven military protection. That would, and in fact, not just Western, I think that's probably universal for states that your economic interests of your society drive what you expect your guardians to protect. But the way you initially phrased it, we've also seen a history, particularly during the period of European colonization, where private law enabled corporate entities to essentially act as nation states and you'd have private militaries. And I think a lot of people are already astounded at the power that individual companies have in order to provide military advantage just with space-based services as relates to, for instance, in Ukraine right now. And I personally think that I would say that the danger is the opposite of what you say. So I think it's a temperate world where great powers are careful about securing their economic interests and respect each other's interests and are wary of escalation. And so a world where, for instance, the U.S. and Europe have an Artemis base camp that's doing important economic activity. I'm not talking about the anemic, uninspiring, scientific Antarctica base camp non-vision that most people have with the moon. I'm talking about an industrial facility that's actually building green energy satellites, that's mining bills that make human life better on Earth, that provide for the expansion of civilization, industrialization, that future, and an equivalent activity, probably by China, perhaps in their current vision shared with Russia, and sort of, you know, two space navies dancing around each other, making sure that the lines of commerce are safe. I think that's a stable world. I think that's a pretty good world. On the other hand, a more dangerous world is one in which You don't have those space navies up there, but in fact, you have corporations left to fend for themselves and they self-help and they're willing to engage in an escalation that might suddenly put you in a place that you don't want to be. And so I think among the worst possibilities would be that the U.S. Space Force says, that's not our job. Our job is just to protect military satellites looking down at Earth, you know, space explore and just do what you need to do out there. And the Chinese billionaires do the same. I think that is a world of where there is insufficient governance and possibilities of escalation that, that is more worrisome. So I don't see the presence of constabulary and armed military forces as being more likely to lead to conflict. I think they're more likely to lead to 
wariness and well thought out policy. That's interesting. That was the response to the to the Hollywood movie, but you created some very interesting scenarios in your books, very extensive at the end. And what are the most relevant that you see? You know, I mean, there are numerous scenarios and micro scenarios. So, you know, what we do in that last book is we transcribe all the little dirty tricks that we have seen powers do on Earth and suggest, you know, how could you do tourism aggression? How could you do infrastructure aggression? You know, what could you do with lawfare? How can you use maps in, in nefarious ways? But essentially, you know, what we outline is in terms of what matters the most, it is, it's ultimately who has the concentration of power. And if you look at where nation states are likely to be as you get to the 2060-ish time frame, it's shocking how close in GDP China and India and the United States are projected to be. They're just neck and neck. And so a, a slight advantage that could come from resources on the moon that is opening an even larger, you can think about it as those images of where you see like a dam eroding and at first it's like a little teeny river and then it carves out and then suddenly it just washes through it, right? Well, space resources, I think, are going to follow that kind of an exponential curve. And they'll be very slow at first. They'll be tiny and easy to dismiss, like this very interesting ice space attempt to gather some dirt and sell it to NASA as a precedent. But over time, it's going to just gradually go up that slope, that hockey puck slope, to become more important. Certainly by 2050 or so, it could be important enough to make a difference in who is the largest nation. And here we have this divergence point where the great powers could come to a disagreement. And here we paint in the book not some giant space war, but really something that is more of a crisis point that determines things. And one of the interesting things that we make clear in this is that because all the great powers care about coalitional support and leadership within the international community, they have to pay attention to the audience costs or the opinions of the smaller states. And so the smaller states become important brokers. They come, become important promulgators of norms. They confer legitimacy. And so when you reach a crisis point where the great powers might disagree, the agency of the middle powers, the smaller powers, can play a huge difference in which the world ends up. And so at the macro level, we look at what would it be like if the United States, there are you know, sort of three obvious scenarios that China dominates, that the United States r remains dominant, even more dominant than they probably are today versus China in space, and then one in which India becomes dominant, and then other ones where there's a balance of power will sort of two face off against, you know, one or one is loosely playing like an offshore balance or role. And within that, we look a lead up to where you would have a commercial interest on the moon that sort of triggers a blockade of sorts and how that gets responded to and why, what is important about, you know, particular geographic areas on the moon that they convey broader advantage for the moon and asteroid in general and why the precedent could matter. So there's at least hopefully a mind expanding discussion about some of the scenarios where things could go. And coming back to our earthbound situation with the war in Ukraine, and I listened carefully, you just not mentioned the Russia as part of this future scenario. But with the war in Ukraine, the US-China tension, not just in the South China Sea, also above your own territory, will space have a chance to remain peaceful? Well, I don't know. Just to recage your gyros a bit, the Earth is in space, right? We are already in space at every moment, traveling through the galaxy at tremendous speeds around the sun. But on this celestial body, which is the current place where we have to think about human freedom and the relative power of autocracy versus more democratic forms of government, it remains as it always has been. You know, republics have always been at threat from autocracies. And I definitely think that because right now all the people, you know, live on Earth, we're going to care an awful lot about how things happen here. 
And in fact, we don't want to see a preponderance of power on Earth make it easy for an autocracy to decide the future of all human beings and their dignity and lack of human rights into the future. I think it's very unclear. I think that this is the most pessimistic I've been about the possibility of great power war. I think the situation continues to erode and get worse with respect to China. I would say that whereas I have concerns about China as a security threat and rival going back, way back to 2004, I don't think most Americans or even military officers shared my view. I think they had a very benign view of China and thought that we were so embedded with each other economically that the conflict was just not possible. And I don't find very many of those people anymore. I think China's behavior, when they ended their charm offensive and became more muscular, scared a lot of their near abroad neighbors. I think Europe has been slow to come around to this perspective, but I think as they move ever closer to supplying lethal weapons to Russia in the war with Ukraine, as they've hinted, I fully expect that Europe will likewise, you know, have the illusions fall from their eyes about what an autocratic single party state is and what it means to do business and be friendly with one. I think the current trajectory of the world is to continue to split into in sort of a very Cold War style. I don't think it'll likely be, we're already so much more integrated than we were, but I think we're going to see increasing disengagements. I think it's very likely that Russia and China will continue to push each other into their spheres. And, you know, and for a while, it wasn't entirely clear. We saw Russia and China take the step of talking about their joint moon base. And then Russia began with Chinese tacit approval, their aggression in Ukraine. And then for a while, it looked like maybe China wasn't too, too happy with how that was going. I'm sure that had they rapidly gotten Kiev, China would have taken that as a license to go and take Taiwan. But the fact that it hasn't gone so well, initially, I think China cooled their discussion about Russia in public with regard to the moon base. But now that China seems to be swinging even harder in favor of Russia and Ukraine, I, it wouldn't surprise me if we saw a more open embrace when it comes to space as well. I think the problem will be that Russia is probably being sapped quite significantly by this. They're already a smaller economy than France, and whether or not they'll be able to keep up their investments in space as well as their investments in the military and their commitments to China for the joint lunar base is at least doubtful. But I don't see tensions. There's nothing on the horizon that makes me think that there is a reason to suppose that tensions are going to get better and the boldness of this balloon flyover is certainly concerning. And the, probably the larger thing is what that has done to the American psyche. Because the average Joe in America probably doesn't give much thought to China and may have heard something about them with respect to Taiwan or the South China Sea, but what has that got to do with them? But Violating America's airspace just gets the John Wayne up in every American and was not a wise move when it comes to attempting to shape public opinion, you know, because they, the strategic culture of America is to underreact, 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 and then way overreact. Thank you very much for your time, Peter. But before I leave you here from the hook, I could read there's a new book in the progress. Can you give us some light where that will bring us and when that will be out? All right. Scramble for the Skies is really meant to be a book that stands the test of time. It should be current for like the next 200 years, I would think. And it really takes a broad look at uh, a very academic book, look about what is happening in the U.S. and China and India and the middle powers and, you know, how this might help. The new book, The Next Space Race, is really an assessment specifically of the U.S. versus China, what they're doing, what we're doing, where the United States in particular has it wrong, and what are the policy steps that it needs to do now in the next few years in order to put itself in a position to protect the long-term interests 
of a rule-based democratic order and not to lose the game for all of us who have an investment in a form of government that values human freedom and representation. And so it has specific recommendations for NASA and the Space Force and Congress and what we should be thinking about with regard to citizen partnerships. And it's meant to be a very timely book that is targeted mostly at policymakers to say, this is what you should be doing so you don't lose the game. Thank you very much. Looking forward to see that on the bookshelves and take it as granted. There will be another invitation for one of our programs. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much. If you have further questions, reach out to us at radio at spacewatch.global. If you like these or other episodes of Space Cafe Radio, leave us a rating on your preferred podcast platform. It is the currency of today. And if you want to stay on the pulse of the space industry, please visit our website at www.spacewatch.global and subscribe to our newsletters. And of course, don't forget to become a Space Watcher. I'm Torsten Kreening, publisher at spacewatch.global, your independent perspective on space. Space Watch.